the Lord Jesus Christ is risen. That's right. Christianity is simple. It is the work of God to save sinners who simply believe in the work that God does through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. By contrast, the world's various religions are either a confusion of that truth, a distortion of that truth, or some invention by man, typically with a human leader that must be followed and imitated, whose enlightened findings must be rehearsed. Often the world's religions are the following of some tragic martyrdom of some local hero. But Christianity is not an adherence to the teachings of an enlightened founder of some ancient religion. It is not the rehearsal of the wise sayings of some long-dead guru. Christianity is not a following in the footsteps of some well-meaning martyr. We worship the death-conquering, sin-canceling, life-giving Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who is very much alive, who is at the right hand of his Father in heaven, and who will return in victory to establish his kingdom and to subdue his enemies. I want to turn our attention this morning to an Old Testament prophecy that depicts our present era. You may have wondered, what what is Jesus doing since the resurrection? And this text is going to give us some insight into that. I want us to look this morning at Psalm 110. Psalm 110. This is an Old Testament prophecy. In fact, this song written by King David a thousand years before Christ actually depicts our present time this day. And it describes three aspects of Jesus' present activities, what Jesus has done since the resurrection. There's some men that are ready to pass out Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to be able to follow along this morning in God's Word so that you can see it for yourself. Just slip your hand up and let these men know that you'd like to have a copy of God's Word. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to keep this. Psalm 110. A Psalm of David. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we look to this song, this old prophecy about our Savior. And we rejoice with King David. What King David looked forward to, we look back on and we gaze on now even with the eyes of faith and we anticipate the return of Christ to this earth. Help us now, O Lord, by your Holy Spirit to understand your word that we might worship the risen Christ. I pray this morning that those who have not yet known him personally, who have not yet bowed the knee or confessed with their tongues, that he is Lord, would do so this day and find salvation and rest and new life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a prophecy written by David about Jesus of Nazareth, David's great, 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 great grandson. I don't think I got the right number of greats. You can check my math on that. This descendant of David is a descendant in the lineage of David, and yet this one is also David's God. To introduce this text that we'll be studying this morning, 
I want to turn our attention to the New Testament. I want you to see how the gospel writers and how Jesus himself employed this text, Psalm 110, to talk about his own life and ministry. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew 22, Jesus is having one of his exchanges with the Pharisees, those leaders of Israel who should have known God's word and God's ways and who were antagonistic to Jesus. In Matthew 22, Jesus is quizzing those religious leaders, the Pharisees. And and here in this quiz, he affirms that David wrote Psalm 110. He also affirms that Psalm 110 are the words of the Holy Spirit. He also affirms that it is a prophecy, a prediction about the future Messiah. He also affirms that the Messiah would be a descendant of David and that the Messiah would be the Lord of David that Messiah would be enthroned at the right hand of Almighty God, and that Messiah would one day put his boot on the neck of his enemies. Jesus affirms all of these things here, and in so doing, Jesus actually claims to be that Messiah, to be divine, to be supernatural, to be God in the flesh, and to one day put his foot on the necks of his enemies. Matthew 22, beginning at verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ or the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And how did the religious leaders take this quiz? Did they get the answer correctly? Look at verse 46. No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him any more questions. Jesus stopped them in their tracks. You see, in Jewish writings, before and during the time of Christ, Psalm 110 was seen to depict someone other than David, someone after David, and someone greater than David. The Jews had actually connected Psalm 110 to Psalm 2 and Daniel 7 and Psalm 8. You see, Psalm 110 portrays Yahweh's king who would conquer the nations. Psalm 2 portrays that same reality, but also calls him God's son, Psalm 8 shows us that God's intent has always been to have a man rule over the creation. And Daniel 7 depicts a supernatural individual called the Son of Man appearing in God's throne room, the one that God gives glory and dominion to, and that all the nations and all the peoples and all the languages will serve him, and that one's kingdom will be forever. It was common in the first century for the Jews to put all of these realities together and to put them all into their idea, their concept of the person of Messiah. This one that they anticipated, woven together through the Old Testament scriptures, God's anointed. In fact, the literature written after the last book of the Old Testament and before the first book of the New Testament is filled with anticipation and speculation about this Messiah. So the Pharisees felt the weight of what Jesus was getting at. By the 22nd chapter of Matthew, it's clear that they are Jesus' enemies. And if Jesus of Nazareth is truly the one referred to in Psalm 110, then the Pharisees are in a heap of trouble. They will one day find themselves under the boot of King Jesus. Psalm 110 sets the record for being the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament, quoted at least 22 times, referred to more than that. And the basic message is this, Jesus is the exalted king who paid for our sins and he is coming back and right now he's waiting. Matthew, Mark 12 quotes Psalm 110 to display the prophetic exaltation of Messiah. Mark 14, Acts 2 and Acts 5, it uses it to vindicate Jesus before unbelievers. In Matthew 26, Jesus quotes Psalm 110 in answer to the question, are you the Messiah? And then when people hear the answer, they claim that he's blaspheming. In Acts 2, Peter quotes it to demonstrate the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, that chapter on the resurrection, Paul cites Psalm 110 to show that every power and every authority will be subjected to Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.3 introduces Jesus as the Messiah and the priest and king by quoting this text. Hebrews 1.13 Psalm 110 is used to describe the superiority of Jesus over everything. In Hebrews chapter 5 and all of Hebrews chapter 7, Psalm 110 is employed to demonstrate that Jesus is our high priest who paid for our sins with his own blood. And in Romans 8.34, Paul uses this text to prove that Jesus' priestly work of intercession after the resurrection in his Father's presence is going on on behalf of believers. If there's an Old Testament text that describes the ministry of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has come to do, it is this one, Psalm 110. Jesus, the one who died on a cross and rose from the dead, is the King over all kings, and there is a day coming when everyone will recognize it. What is Psalm 110 all about? King David's prophetic song describes three features of the ministry of the risen Christ. We're going to look at those three features briefly this morning. The first is this, Jesus waits to bring his kingdom to earth. Look at the first three verses of Psalm 110. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The word for says in our English Bibles is simply a noun for utterance. And this is a technical word only used in prophetic literature. It is an oracle of God. It is a future prophetic utterance. And here, this is a, a song of David, a prophetic utterance from Yahweh from the self-existent, covenant-keeping God of Israel who knows and speaks the future. Here, in David's day, God is speaking the future, a prophetic utterance. And notice what's uttered in this prophecy. Yahweh says to my Lord. The my is David. David has a Lord. David is the king over the ruling superpower of the world in its golden age. He doesn't have anybody in charge of him. This text says someone is in charge of the king. And who is in charge of David? It is David's Lord. This is none other than David's descendant who pre-existed before David was born. He is also David's maker, the king of kings, none other than the second person of the Trinity who will be born at Bethlehem as Jesus of Nazareth. Yahweh says to Jesus, in this prophetic utterance, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is the God man. This is Jesus the Christ. And he has been at the right hand of his father since his resurrection from the dead. Charles Spurgeon said this during the present interval, through which we wait for his glorious appearing and visible millennial kingdom. Jesus is in the place of power, and his dominion is in no jeopardy, or otherwise he would not remain quiet. That is, Jesus is content at the Father's command to wait to have what is rightfully his. That is a kingdom on earth where his enemies are subdued and his people live in paradise. And so even though the nations rage and rebellious men rebel and tyrants rule and people suffer, these are no threat to the promise of God and the kingdom of His Son. And what is it that Jesus is waiting for? Verse 1, until I subjugate or humiliate your enemies, says the Father. The history of time ends with the triumph of good over evil, not, however, with the immediate annihilation of it, but with its subjugation. In verse 2, we see that Yahweh will stretch forth His strong scepter, no limits given to this governance. The idea is that God will stretch forth his son's reign without opposition. He will rule the earth from Jerusalem. Even Jesus' enemies will be his subjects during his earthly kingdom. Listen to Psalm 66, 3 and 4. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. Even Jesus' enemies will pretend obedience 
All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. This is a time of enforced obedience of Jesus' enemies and the willing obedience of Jesus' loyal subjects. Verse 3, he will reign with a loyal people. Literally, your people will be free will offerings. Your people will be free will offerings. Not that people will come to the temple and give free will offerings, but they will freely give of themselves as living sacrifices before the Lord in that day. And they will do so in the holy garments of priests. Listen, under Mosaic law, that was illegal. Second Chronicles 20, 21. Only the priests are designated to wear those clothes. But in that day, in Messiah's reign, all of God's people will be dressed in priestly, holy array. Not just a class of priestly people, but all the people dressed in the beauty of holiness, the garments of holy sacrifice before the Lord. Verse 3 tells us, Your youth, your young men, will be as numerous, as fresh, as the dew on the mountainside in the morning. This is a picture of a vigorous, holy, loyal army of subjects, joyfully devoted to the king. And the king who leads this brilliant band of priestly people is himself a priest. Notice verse 4. This is the second feature of Jesus' present ministry. He has finished his atoning work. He sits at the right hand of the Father, and his priestly atoning work is accomplished. It stands accomplished. Look what David says. Yahweh has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This king is a priest. And again, under Mosaic law, that would have been illegal. You couldn't be a king and a priest. There was an appropriate division of those authorities. And besides, the kings were to come from the line of Judah, and the priests were to come from the line of Levi. Any king who did priestly duties, like Saul tried, got in big trouble. And so this king, if he was to be a priest, had to be something different than what Mosaic law prescribed. In fact, the order of his priesthood predates Mosaic law and postdates Mosaic law. You will be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Mosaic law was to give way to something else, and you would be this priest forever. All the priests under Mosaic law were temporary. Their office was temporary as a whole, and each individual priest's service was temporary because every priest died and had to be replaced. But this one is like Melchizedek, and you can read about Melchizedek in Genesis 14, Psalm 110, and Hebrews. Not much is said about Melchizedek in the Bible, and maybe you'll name a son with the middle name Melchizedek. It's a great middle name. Melchizedek was the king of a town called Salem. Salem is the Hebrew word for peace. He was the king of peace. Uh, The the Jebusites held the city of Salem. That is why Jerusalem is called Jerusalem, because it was held by the Jebusites of Salem. And this king of Salem has another name, Melchizedek, which literally means the king of righteousness. So simultaneously, his name is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. And there's silence surrounding this human figure called Melchizedek in Scripture. He's of unknown lineage, a mystery of birth and death. And as a figure in history, he appears immortal. His life, his kingship, his priesthood point to and anticipate the priest-king role of the second person of the Trinity, of God the Son, of Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus, as a priest and king in the order of Melchizedek, sat down, verse 1, the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 1.3 says, when he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Listen, priests in their Mosaic law didn't sit down. They kept standing. They had to keep offering sacrifices over and over and over again. And, And when one priest duty was over, his time of service was over, another priest came and there was always a priest standing and standing and working and offering because all of those sacrifices only pointed to the one final finished sacrifice that only this priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, could accomplish. And when he finished his work, he sat down. 
It means when you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross to pay for sins, it means that sins are actually paid for, that God's justice has been satisfied and his anger against sin has been quenched for all who would believe in him. And when Jesus uttered, it is finished, hanging from the cross, it means the work of atonement, of making us at one with God was finally and fully complete. Our king took a painful crown of thorns, a mocking scepter made of reeds and a purple robe as a costume for the amusement of his tormentors. He was lifted up before the world, not in the honor that is due him, but stripped naked, bloodied, shamed, and scorned so that by his own death he could offer to God a sacrifice of atonement for sin. And there at the cross, the king was victim. The priest was the sacrifice. The author of life subjected himself to death. The innocent and beautiful son of the father clothes himself in the sins of humanity so that he could endure the punishment due those sins. Poet F.W. Pitt wrote the lines to the maker of the universe. I'll read them to you. The maker of the universe, as man for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made, unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow, which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head, by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. And the throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. And a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. This king, having risen from the dead, sits at the right hand of the Father and waits for the right time when he will return in unmistakable triumph. Third feature of his present ministry is the anticipation of his return in unmistakable triumph. Psalm 110, 5 to 7. David, speaking to God, says, The Lord is at your right hand. And if you're paying close attention to capital letters in your text, this one is capital L, lowercase o-r-d. It's the Hebrew word edonai. It means Lord or master. The Lord is at your, and the your is Yahweh. A reference back to verse 1 with the all capital letters, Lord. In other words, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, in verse 5, says David. And he, Jesus, will crush kings and bring the obedience of the nations under his rule and reign We won't go through all the details in this section, but simply close with verse 7. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. That is a reference to the ease of victory of this coming king. He will lay waste to his enemies, and it will be easy for him, so easy that as he's marching in and having his victory, he'll take a drink by the brook. Consider the one who said on the cross, I thirst in the presence of his enemies. will easily take a drink from the brook on his way to an easy victory and his enthronement on the earth. John Calvin wrote, As a shepherd is gentle towards his flock, but fierce and formidable towards wolves and thieves, in like manner, Christ is kind and gentle towards those who commit themselves to his care while they who willfully and obstinately reject his yoke shall feel with what awful and terrible power he is armed. What is Jesus doing since the resurrection? He is waiting for the Father's perfect timing to establish his kingdom on the earth. 
And he stands and sits at the Father's right hand, having already accomplished the work of atonement. And he will return to his earth to establish his kingdom, to rejoice with his people, and to subdue his enemies. As you look back on the cross of Christ, are you covered in his blood? Do you rejoice in an empty tomb? Do you rest now in his present work of being your stand-in before the Father as one who has already accomplished the work of redemption and taken care of your sin, believer? And are you eagerly anticipating his return? Do you pray even as he taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is already being done in heaven? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is you we love, it is you we worship, it is you we are in awe of. May you be the song of our hearts, even as you are the song of David's heart. May we live in light of what you have already accomplished. May we live in anticipation of what you will do. And may we proclaim your name and your love and your power and the hope that is in you to everyone that can hear. Until your return, we pray it in your precious name.